Many people have estrogen metabolism problems, which can be a risk factor for certain types of cancers, and estrogen dominance can trigger autoimmunity. This is Dr. Eric Osansky, and in this video, I'll be discussing the estrogen section of the Dutch test, including the estrogen markers, estrogen metabolism ratios, and I'll discuss how you can support estrogen metabolism. Before I begin, I just want to remind you that the main reason I put together these videos is to help people with different types of autoimmune conditions and other health issues better understand their test results so that they can find and remove their triggers, correct any underlying imbalances, and feel great again. I'd first like to start out by discussing whether estrogen is good or bad. Of course, there really is no such thing as a bad hormone, although too much of any hormone can have detrimental effects. With regards to estrogen, there are three different types, which includes estradiol, estrone, and estriol. Estradiol is considered to be the dominant estrogen, but the other two hormones also have important roles. While too much estrogen can be harmful, healthy levels of estrogen is of course important for any cycling woman looking to get pregnant, but estrogen has other benefits, as it has anti-inflammatory effects. That being said, too much estrogen can possibly be an autoimmune trigger, and of course it could also be a factor in estrogen-dependent cancers. You need sufficient progesterone to balance the estrogen, and I want to mention that progesterone can increase regulatory T cells and decrease Th17 cells. T regs, or again regulatory T cells, these help to suppress autoimmunity, while Th17 cells promote autoimmunity. There are three phases of detoxification, and all three of these phases play a role in detoxifying estrogen. I'm going to go over these in greater detail in this video, but I first want to give a brief overview. In phase one detoxification, you have hydroxylation to the 2, 4, and 16 hydroxy metabolites. Phase two involves methylation, and while some people think of MTHFR when it comes to methylation, there is also an enzyme called COMT that plays a very important role in the detoxification of estrogens. Phase three involves the kidneys and bile in the excretion of estrogens. Now I'd like to discuss the specific estrogen metabolites, starting with the 2-hydroxy E1 metabolite. This is considered to be the good estrogen metabolite, although as I mentioned earlier, even the so-called bad metabolites have important roles in the body in small amounts. The 2-hydroxy metabolite does not bind as tightly to the estrogen receptors as the 4-hydroxy or 16-hydroxy metabolites. The 2-hydroxy metabolites form stable addicts with DNA, which is a good thing. And the 2-hydroxy E1 metabolite gets methylated into 2-methoxy E1 via the enzyme COMT. I'll actually show some Dutch test reports shortly so that you have a better understanding of this. Now let's talk about the 4-hydroxy E1 metabolite, which is considered to be the bad metabolite, as it can cause the proliferation of estrogen-dependent cancers, and the reason for this is because it forms unstable addicts. It also binds tightly to the estrogen receptor. I also want to mention that estradiol can increase the enzyme CYP1B1, which can lead to higher levels of the 4-hydroxy metabolite. Like the 4-hydroxy metabolite, the 16-hydroxy E1 metabolite binds tightly to the estrogen receptor, and while the 4-hydroxy E1 metabolite seems to be the worst of the two, higher levels of the 16-hydroxy E1 can also cause a proliferation of estrogen-dependent cancers. So let's take a look at the estrogen section of the Dutch report. And on top, we see the three different types of estrogens. We see estrone, estradiol, and estriol. And estrone clearly elevated at 34. Estradiol, you can see elevated as well, 5.76. And we see the range here of 1.80 to 4.50. And if this person were menopausal, that this would be the menopausal ranges of each of these. And estriol is within range, but on the higher side of 14.4. And if we move down a little bit, we see the estrogen metabolism ratios. So in the green represents the 2-hydroxy metabolite. In this case, a little bit over 80%. So ideally, it should be 60 to 80%, a little bit higher, not a huge big deal. But the red is the 4-hydroxy metabolite, the so-called bad metabolite. And so this is uh, 10%, so looking okay. And the 16-hydroxy is 7.3%, so actually a little bit low, which is better than it being high, although it does have some good health benefits. And here we see, again, 2-hydroxy E1, 4-hydroxy E1, 
and then the 16 hydroxy E1. And we'll take a further look at this report in just a minute or two. Next, I'd like to briefly talk about the CYP1A1 and CYP1B1 enzymes, which also play a role in estrogen metabolism. These enzymes play a role in phase one detoxification as CYP1A1 will upregulate the 2-hydroxy pathway, while CYP1B1 will upregulate the 4-hydroxy pathway. Once again, 4-hydroxy metabolites can cause unstable adducts, which can increase cancer risk. As for the difference between a stable and unstable addict, Stable addicts remain in DNA, whereas unstable, also known as depurinating addicts, these break off from DNA and can increase cancer risk. So looking at this report again, here we see the CYP1A1 enzyme, and we can see how this leads to the 2-hydroxy E1 metabolite. And here we see the CYP1B1, which leads to the 4-hydroxy metabolite. And as we'll see in greater detail, the 4-hydroxy metabolite, ideally you want it to go through methylation. It can go through another pathway, but then if you have adequate glutathione, that could also be beneficial when it comes to phase 2 detoxification. Once again, we'll look at this more closely shortly. Let's now talk about how to increase estrogen metabolism. Inzoli 3 carbonyl, also known as I3C, this can support estrogen metabolism. You could get I3C from cruciferous vegetables such as broccoli, and you could also take this in supplement form. However, I3C needs stomach acid to convert into diendole methane, also known as DIM. You also could take DIM directly in supplement form. DIM does have a short half-life, and so it's something you would want to take daily if you have estrogen metabolism problems. DIM increases the conversion of estrone and estradiol into 2-hydroxy E1, which once again is a good estrogen metabolite. As for the dosage, you'd want to take 100 to 300 milligrams per day. And if you're wondering whether you could just eat cruciferous vegetables, you can and should eat cruciferous vegetables on a daily basis to support estrogen metabolism. But if someone has a known problem with estrogen metabolism that's confirmed by the Dutch test, then it probably would be wise to eat cruciferous vegetables and take a DIM supplement. You also want to increase glutathione. Glutathione is the master antioxidant and supports phase two detoxification. NAC, also known as N-acetylcysteine, this is a precursor of glutathione, and so taking NAC is an option. The dosage would be between 600 to 1800 milligrams per day, ideally in between meals. NAC can also prevent damage to the DNA by reducing attic formation. Another option is to take a liposomal or acetylated glutathione supplement. You also don't want to be deficient in any of the glutathione cofactors, which include selenium, vitamin C, and magnesium. It's also important to support methylation. The enzyme catechol all methyltransferase, or COMT, this is involved in the detoxification and excretion of estrogens. If someone has a genetic variation of the COMT gene, then this can cause decreased activity and thus decrease the detoxification of estrogen. Some people are familiar with MTHFR, which also plays a role in methylation, and you do need methyl donors to support methylation, and some examples include methylated folate, methylated B12, as well as vitamin B6. Trimethylglycine also supports methylation and is available in supplement form. I have what's called a homozygous C677T MTHFR polymorphism, and the methylation supplement I take includes methylated folate, B12, B6, and it also includes trimethylglycine. It's also worth mentioning that some people don't do well with methylated supplements. Magnesium can also help to support methylation. So let's go back to the Dutch test report, and here we see 4-hydroxy E1, and we see it going through methylation, which is optimal. It could also go down this pathway and become a reactive intermediate. However, if you have enough glutathione, then it could be detoxified this way as well. So if you don't have healthy methylation pathways and it goes down this pathway and becomes a reactive intermediate and you don't have enough glutathione, then it could continue going down this pathway. And as you can see, if not detoxified, 4-hydroxy E1 can bind to and damage DNA. And on this next slide, we'll take a closer look at this pathway over here, which relates to methylation. So here we see 2-hydroxy E1 
gets methylated via the COMT enzyme into 2-methoxy-E1. And we could see that methylation activity is on the lower side. So in this case, we definitely want to do things to support methylation. It's important to understand what slows down the COMT enzyme, as if you have a slow COMT, then this will have a negative effect on estrogen metabolism. I'd like to give credit to Dr. Kerry Jones for some of the information I'm about to discuss. As I already mentioned, having a plus plus COMT genetic polymorphism can slow down this enzyme, and then certain gut infections can slow down COMT, as can drinking green tea and quercetin. Exposure to xenoestrogens such as bisphenol A or BPA, as well as PCBs can slow down COMT, and certain medications can also inhibit COMT. Finally, you also want to support phase three. Having regular bowel movements is important and proper bile flow is necessary. Some of the natural agents that can support bile metabolism include choline, taurine, and bile salts. The gut microbiome also plays a role in estrogen metabolism, as intestinal dysbiosis can lead to high levels of an enzyme called beta-glucuronidase, which can prevent the excretion of estrogens and allow it to re-enter the circulation. So let's go ahead and summarize the estrogen detoxification strategies. Of course, you want to minimize your exposure to exogenous estrogens, especially xenoestrogens such as BPA. You want to support methylation whenever necessary increase glutathione. Eating plenty of cruciferous vegetables can help to support estrogen metabolism. This not only includes broccoli, kale, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, but broccoli sprouts as well. You might want to consider supplementing with DIM, methane, especially if you test positive for an estrogen metabolism problem on the Dutch test. Be aware of some of the things I discussed that slows down COMT. And of course, you want to support phase three detoxification. And part of this is correcting intestinal dysbiosis, which will especially be helpful if you have elevated levels of beta-glucuronidase, as I mentioned earlier. During this presentation, I mentioned how the gut microbiome plays a role in estrogen metabolism, and I created a video on the GI map comprehensive stool panel that you might want to check out. The GI map does test for beta-glucuronidase, which also can relate to the detoxifications of estrogens. If you like this video, please click on the like button below, and I'll catch you in the next video.